Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this uh, week's micro lectures are going to be dealing with the topic of water and heat balance. And in this first one, uh, essentially, I'll cover the, some basic concepts associated with thermoregulation, how much it costs, and trade offs in this process. Essentially, the, the first issue I would address is what is it that we call body temperature? And this can be a little bit of a, it, it's obvious to everyone, I think, but it's difficult to talk or to, to, to describe what a body temperature is, uh, <clears throat> unless we agree that body temperature actually refers to core body temperature. That means the temperature inside the core of the body, which is probably the most constant temperature we can find, or is it? The thermal, the, the, the thermal sensor in the body is actually located in the hypothalamus. Perhaps that is the point where we could actually locate our core body temperature. The problem is that no matter how we define it, we are always limited as researchers to where and how can we measure body temperature. And that's why in many respects, core body temperature actually refers to um, cloacal temperature, for example, or rectal temperature as it's a temperature that it can be relatively easily measured. Because obviously skin temperature, actually this is skin temperature in a given animal you, you may want, uh, in a range, a temperature range between 22 and 35 degrees. And notice how skin temperature at the lowest temperatures is lower and then it gets closer to core body temperature, but it is still distinct from it. So. Such a, a thing as body temperature, it's probably better to define it as core temperature, skin temperature, or wherever this measurement actually has taken place. And you will see that this is particularly important in the light of some of the things that I will be presenting today. <coughs> Measurements done in sled dogs, reindeer, different parts of the, of the head, you, you would be getting or you would be receiving many different uh, types of many different temperatures. If you go down the extremities in the legs, in these animals that are actually in contact, the paws, for example, that are in contact with the environmental or with the ground, that could reach zero degrees. So the gradients are very large. Of course, in these extremities, in these paws, there are some control mechanisms that allow for or that prevent losing too much heat into the environment and this is something that uh, you probably have heard from before in the th in the in the mechanisms of um, <coughs> counter current heat exchange and you have this uh, you have this uh, an example of these mechanisms in two examples here one in a situation where the blood flow the arterial blood flow it's shown in red here basically going down the paws and then back up from it through the veins. Notice that if the arteries and the veins have very little in contact with each other, what you have is basically a, a, a heat loss through these paws. There is, there is more heat that is going to be lost to the environment because temperature here reached down or the, the, the temperature of the blood here came down to 24. The strategy that most Arctic animals use actually is to prevent this heat loss by actually getting into to close opposition the blood vessels <coughs> as they are descending or as they are ascending. In this case, instead, what you see is that part of the heat, as the arterial blood is going down, as it's getting cooled, part of the heat is transferred into the veins. And the final result is that the temperature reaching down to the extremities, the pause is much lower, and because it's much lower, the amount of heat lost to the environment is also decreased. So obviously, animals that act, uh, will, will display uh, different temperatures in different parts of the body are still able to control or to regulate these temperatures by using mechanisms uh, such as the one here on countercurrent heat exchange. Uh, this is the same mechanism, the, the, the countercurrent uh, heat exchanger. Now, with some information shown in these arrows, and what this information is showing is that basically part of the heat 
that's the one you see in red. Part of the heat that actually flows, no, sorry, of course, this is the blood. The blood that is flowing actually down the leg and up is always the same. That's why these arrows are always the same. And uh, this is this different from the amount of heat because notice that the heat that is actually going down the leg because of the close contact between arteries and veins, it's, a, it's possible that some of this heat is transferred into the veins, therefore less heat reaches the extremities, so less heat can be lost. This is a fundamental mechanism to actually avoid heat loss in appendages. Uh, and it depends on this countercurrent uh, heat principle. <clears throat> Body temperature is an important environmental, it's an important uh, parameter. Mm -hmm. It's an important parameter because it has large implications of metabolism. And this is something that's not going to surprise you, as we were talking last week as, uh, about aerobic scope and the oxygen capacity limited uh, thermal tolerance theory. Mm -hmm. uh, but what you see in, in, in essence in this graph is that metabolism, metabolic rate, is actually a product of temperature. So as body temperature increases, so does metabolism as well. Mm -hmm. And the particularity is that when you plot this data into logarithmic scales, notice that both the x and the y axis in, is, an, in, is in a logarithmic scale, all of a sudden then this graph actually shows a linear relationship. This is true for animals that do not regulate body temperature. This is true for animals that allow their body temperature to fluctuate with environmental temperature. These animals, the animals that we call ectotherms, that they don't produce their own body heat, as we will see in a second. Mm -hmm. We could say, essentially, that metabolic rate roughly doubles with every 10 degrees of temperature. And now you should also understand why it doubles. When we say that metabolic rate doubles every 10 degrees means we mean that the Q10, the temperature coefficient we were discussing earlier, is 2 because it's a doubling factor here. Mm -hmm. Unlike in homeotherms or endotherms that produce their body heat, animals that actually regulate body temperature show a completely different relationship between body temperature or ambi ambient temperature and metabolic rate. For animals that control their own body temperature, there is a region called the thermoneutral zone. This is the range of ambient temperatures at which metabolic rate resting metabolism is lowest. And above an upper critical temperature or below a lower critical temperature, metabolism increases. So in endotherms, animals that regulate their own body temperature or animals that, uh, that actually produce heat to regulate body temperature, you have a thermoneutral zone in which metabolism is constant, and then as temperatures go, ambient temperatures go lower or higher, there is an increase in metabolism. We will see an example of that in a second. What, what these differences bring us to, basically, is a question of considering for every animal two essential questions. Can the animal produce its own body heat? The answer can be yes, then we are talking about an endotherm. The answer is no, we are talking about ectotherms, also called poikilotherms. Mm -hmm. The other question is basically the ability to thermoregulate. Can the animal thermoregulate? Yes or no. An ectotherm does not, does not thermoregulate, well, it's, it, it would be a truly poikilotherm or ectotherm. But there are poikilotherms, there are ectotherms that can still thermoregulate. They do not do it at the expense of their own body heat. They do not produce their own energy. They do, do not produce their own heat. But instead, they use environmental heat in the form of behavioral thermoregulation. Behavioral thermoregulation is common, for example, in reptiles that sit in the sun and bask. Their body temperature can be as high as it will be an endotherm but it's purely derived from the environment, via radiation, via capturing energy from sun rays, for example. In the other side, we have endotherms, animals that, for the most, will regulate their body temperature. Therefore, the answer to thermoregulation will be, will be, it will be yes. 
these are animals that homeotherms that keep body temperature constant, birds and mammals. Non-thermoregulating endotherms. That's a good question. What is a non-thermoregulating non endotherm? I'm not sure I can come up with an example here. But we will see other examples in a, in a few slides, actually in the next uh, lecture. What I was saying is that reptiles, reptiles can maintain their own body heat. Reptiles will not necessarily let their body temperature fluctuate with ambient temperatures. If you actually take a lizard model, that means a lizard that looks like a lizard, but it's not a lizard because it's not alive. What sort of temperatures can you measure in this fake lizard? Well, see the, the white spread? <coughs> if you place a plastic lizard on a stone and measure the body temperature in this plastic lizard, you will be exposed, you will be measuring all kinds of ambient temperatures. Within the same conditions, a proper lizard, a lizard that is actually alive, will show a much more narrow range. What does this mean? This is an animal that cannot or is not producing their own body heat, or, the, or at least not enough to reach high body temperatures. Nevertheless, nevertheless, they do, they do keep body temperature within a certain narrow range. Mm -hmm. This is the example for a ptarmigan, along, going along the lines, the lines of the, our previous uh, slide, thermoneutral zone. The temperature range in which there, is, there are no costs or that metabolism is stable. And here that goes between seven or eight degrees up to 37 or 38 degrees. Above 37, there is an increased metabolic cost. The animal is trying to thermoregulate. The animal is trying to eliminate heat. Or below seven degrees, the animal is actually trying to produce its own body heat and that costs energy. So there are costs associated with thermoregulation, and these costs are important. What is happening during the thermoneutral zone? The, the main thing that we can see from here is that what, within the thermoneutral zone, there are no costs associated with thermoregulation. But that does not mean that the animal is not doing anything. Of course it's doing something. Of course there, are, there is a regulation. And this is what this actually slide is trying to show us. Mechanisms responsible for the regulation of body temperature within the thermoneutral zone are due to changes in vascular resistance and skin conductance. This is what you see here, right? So skin conductance. Skin conductance is high. Uh, now, this, this graph is always wrong. It's basically backwards. This cannot be conductance. This can be thermal resistance because conductance should be low at the low temperatures <coughs> and high at high temperatures. Mm -hmm. So this should not say conductance here. But the point is the same. Basically, this, uh, if, if we look at terms of conductance, we would have to flip the curve here. Conductance is low at low temperatures. It progressively increases and then it reaches a maximum at the high temperatures. So how is the animal changing conductance here? The animal is changing conductance by simply sending more or less blood into the skin. The closer the blood gets to the skin, the easier it is to dissipate heat. So what we are talking is that within the thermoneutral zone, the mechanisms for the thermoregulation are changes in vascular resistance and skin conductance. Mm -hmm. Above this upper critical temperature, above this critical temperature, the animal has to basically eliminate heat. How does it do that? With evaporative heat loss. Evaporative heat loss by actually getting rid of water, and when water disappears, so does the heat of, of evaporation that this water takes with it. Mm -hmm. At low temperatures below the lower critical temperature, what you have are thermogenic mechanisms. Thermogenesis, that means production of heat, via shivering thermogenesis or non-shivering thermogenesis. Shivering thermogenesis based on muscular contraction, fast muscular contraction that produces no work, but nevertheless produces heat. Non-shivering thermogenesis in those animals that can do that because they have brown adipose tissue. The presence of brown adipose tissue allows this specific tissue to produce a lot of heat because the, uh, 
in, in brown adipose tissue, essentially there is no generation of ATP, and instead <coughs> all the energy from the breakdown here is actually directed towards, uh, towards heat, the formation of heat. So, looking at this graph again, within the thermoneutral zone, changes in vascular resistance. Above, evaporative heat loss, sweating and panting are the classical mechanisms, and we will discuss this a little bit later. And finally, at temperatures below, you have thermogenesis, either shivering or non-shivering thermogenesis. Let me emphasize once again, within the thermoneutral zone, the costs are relatively minor because it's enough with change in vascular resistance. Above or below, you have increased costs, and that's why metabolism increases below and above. If we look at the integrated control of thermoregulation, essentially we go to a center in the body that is providing the reference. This center in the body is the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus integrates and takes into consideration or it can be affected by, by any kind of factors that are happening. Pyrogens are agents that give fever. Exercise, tra exercise training or heat acclimation or the time of the day all these factors will have uh, uh, something to say in terms of the temperature reference. But when this temperature reference is set, this temperature is compared with the temperatures that, or the thermal sensations that come from the body, and then you generate a thermal command signal. Thermal command signal is the signal that is deciding is the temperature above or below the, the set point, and then react accordingly. As a result, of course, you have basically a center controlling sweating, a center controlling vasodilation or vasoconstriction, or also integrating behavior. So the animal makes a decision based on the signals that are coming here. The, what is the temperature in the core of the body, the skin temperature? And this is important to consider. We don't really understand how it's happening, but we know that in the brain there is an integration of actually all the thermal inputs that are received, being from the center of the body, the core body temperature, but also from locations in the skin. This is integrated, there is a thermal command signal generated, and basically now the animal is going to put together uh, an integrated response in terms of changing uh, the conductance, the vascular conductance, and changing uh, how much heat is lost or not through the skin, or if necessary, me mechanisms for sweating, sweating or panting, evaporative heat loss, or if necessary, behavioral responses, or even generating mechanisms, thermogenesis mechanisms. <coughs> In men and women, skin temperature contributes about 20% of the control of shivering and, and vasoconstriction. That means that there is an integration, and this is important, but we don't understand how it's happening, between integration of skin temperature and core body temperature. A final detail uh, exemplified by this uh, uh, fox, in which what you see is a, a part or a part of the thermoneutral or, or part of the response, the metabolic response to ambient temperatures in this animal during the summer or during the winter. During the summer, essentially, the lower critical temperature is above, uh, is about, uh, below 10 degrees, and then below this temperature you see that metabolism increases. What happens in the winter? In the winter there is a remarkable response. Basically, the lower critical temperature is now way below, minus 12 degrees instead, and it's not until minus 12 that you have an increased metabolism. Why is that? Pure and simple, as you well know, the insulation. So this animal puts on insulation in the fur, that actually make this shift dramatically, uh, or make this dramatic shift, now the animal can go to much lower temperatures and actually not have incurred uh, increased metabolic costs. This is important, and you understand why. In the summer, this animal could not have the same fur than in the winter, because of course the danger is that then at high temperatures there are gonna be increased costs. But just by adding or changing the insulation in the fur, the animal is adjusting to uh, its, thermone its uh, thermoneutral zone, if you want, or the tolerance to temperatures. 
that was the end for this lecture. Now it's time for some questions.